records on this computer. Okay. Hi everyone, welcome to another Netecla Scotland uh, YouTube interview. I am delighted to be joined by the fabulous Emily Bryson today, who is currently an ESOL lecturer at the City of Glasgow College. Hi Emily, thanks Hello. for joining us today. And I'm going to start with a nice easy question. Um, how did you end up in the job you're currently in? In my ESOL lecturer job? Yes, in your job at Glasgow, yes. Uh, well, firstly, when I finished university, I went to South Korea for a year and taught uh, small children out there, which was great fun. And then when I came back, I enjoyed it enough that I thought I would do a CELTA. Mm -hmm. And so I did my CELTA and then I started volunteering for Glasgow City Council. Um, and from that, I got a job uh, working for what was Glasgow Metropolitan College. Wow. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was as a temp lecturer. And that snowballed three hours a week, snowballed into six, snowballed into nine, ended up in a full-time permanent contract after a good few years. And I've now been working at City of Glasgow College for, this is year number 14. My goodness. You yeah, so, so Met Metropolitan turned into yeah. City of Glasgow. It's had many changes. So interestingly, did you do English language or English language teaching or linguistics at university? Well, I started out learning <laughs> English literature and English language. And I thought, no, nah, I'll never get a job doing this. <laughs> this is silly. So I left and I decided to study business instead. Wow. Well, I didn't leave Glasgow University. I did sure. specialism at Glasgow University. And I actually left with a business degree right. in the end. So... And here I am. Here you are teaching yeah. English. It's interesting. I've noticed quite there's we kind of uh, people that work in English language are two, are two camps. We've either come down that we've trained as it or we've come at it from a completely different career, which is yeah. uh, really, really interesting. So in your day to day job at Glasgow City uh, College, tell me what kind of ESOL teaching do you predominantly do? Uh, over the years, I've done pretty much everything. <laughs> from higher levels, intermediate levels. I did a bit of English for specific purposes and wrote some courses um, for like ESOL for social care, ESOL for customer care. But uh, at the moment, I'm kind of specializing in ESOL literacy and the low levels, like beginner levels. So I really enjoy them because I feel like you really make a difference to their lives. So ESOL literacy learners are learners who maybe don't have literacy in their first language. So maybe Arabic speakers or Kurdish Sirani speakers who haven't learned to read and write in their first language. So English is their first script. Mm -hmm. So it's quite challenging um, yeah. supporting them to read and write and learn English. Yeah. Do you have do you have large volumes of literacy learners now? I mean, do you um, think there's an increase as the years have gone by? No, probably about the same. City of Glasgow College is the biggest college in Scotland and we have a thousand ESOL students every year. And we have two ESOL literacy classes and maybe four starter classes. So they're okay. students who already know the alphabet and can write words, but maybe still need a bit of help with writing sentences. And, and then your years. regular yeah. beginner would be already knows how to read and write um, okay. in, in, in Roman script. How long has Glasgow City been taking in literacy learners? And traditionally, in other parts of Scotland, that literacy level has tended to happen within the community prior to then almost graduating, even at later stages, elementary, pre and before they came to college. Would you say that was the same in Glasgow, or do you think there's just such a massive need? There's Thank such a massive need, I think, because we've kind of, in a way, got a bit of a luxury than having so many students, because then we can really grade them specifically by level. Yeah. If you've got maybe 20 students in your whole cohort, then you're going to have a, quite a mixed bag of levels, aren't you? So... I yeah. like the idea that you have a literacy as a starter, because I've often argued that, you know, before beginners, there's a, at least another, you could almost come out with another three to four levels, couldn't you? Yeah. So I like this idea of literacy starter beginner. I love that, which is great. Have you found that to be quite successful? Yeah, 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 very, very successful. Yeah. Excellent. And actually, um, my colleague has been working on the um, Lisa Phonics project at the moment, so yeah. videos for following the phonics syllabus yeah. and, um, that's been very helpful even to the students with the jagged profiles who are maybe at intermediate level but 
are still struggling a bit with their literacy because sure. they're coming with less support. Mm -hmm. And so you say that you're 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 working with literacies now. Is that would you say that's your favourite level to be literacy yeah. beginner, or yeah. you have had experience with lots of other levels, haven't you? Yeah, I, I don't know what my favourite level is. I guess at the moment I'm kind of going through a I I love literacy um, <laughs> little phase, but I, yeah, I think I think maybe I quite like the pre intermediate intermediate levels as well, and for work. Um, I went through a phase of doing ESOL for work type stuff, which I really enjoyed. So supporting learners into with their interviews and CVs and work skills in general, which is yeah, very rewarding. Great. Thank you. OK, so I know that you're also involved in other work outside of your teaching. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that? OK, so I'm also an English language teaching materials writer. At the moment, I'm working on a course book series for National Geographic Learning which is out in, I think, well, early next year. Excellent. Very exciting. Yeah. Um, so I've written two students' books and a workbook for that. Uh, and I wrote the beginner workbook and the, no, sorry, the beginner, the beginner level and the pre-intermediate level was my focus. Excellent. And before that, I wrote um, a, the A to Z of ESOL, which is photocopyable materials for ESOL learners, because I noticed that there's really not that much in the way out there of ESOL resources. Mm -hmm. We're quite a bit of a Cinderella in that way. If yep. you're going to write materials, the publishers focus on general English because there's a bigger market. There's a whole world out there. Whereas ESOL, it's just, uh, well, I guess, quite focused on the UK or yep. maybe other English speaking countries. So it's a smaller market. Of course. Yeah. Uh, and then, so I've got the day said of ESOL. Mm -hmm. And I've also got the um, 50 ways to teach life skills, which is an, um, 50 activities, different teaching ideas and tips yep. for incorporating life skills into the classroom. Cool. Yeah. How did you get into materials writing? So I think for the average practitioner, it is quite a daunting concept, you know, going from what you do every day in class or using other people's materials. So then leaping into the how do you write your own? I mean, we all adapt, don't we? And we do rewrite it. But how do you make that next leap? Yeah, uh, I think maybe because I started in ESOL and because there were so few resources specifically for ESOL, I think that was quite beneficial to me because it kind of forced me to create my own. But um, we created a suite of courses um, for ESOL for um, specific purposes, ESOL for, for vocational purposes at the college. So ESOL for social care, customer care, employability, construction, loads of different things, early years. I had uh, such a broad <laughs> range of knowledge about all these different subjects. But um, because I created those, that kind of gave me the confidence and then uh, the British Council were advertising for their anniversaries project. So oh, yeah. Yeah. Thing to get published. So that's still available via my blog mm -hmm. um, and on the British Council website. So I've got links on my blog to that. And then from British Council, I, at the time, uh, there was an agent, an English language teaching agent called Nick Robinson, who's now moved on. He still works for Learn Jam, or not, yeah, Learn Jam. Mm -hmm. um, and he got me into Macmillan education. And so for years, I did quite a lot of digital materials, workbooks, kind of background stuff, supplementary stuff for them. Um, and then I wrote my first book, The Aid Said We Saw, and then 50 Ways to Teach Life Skills. And I just kind of took any opportunity that kind of came my way. Mm -hmm. And then National Geographic uh, liked my work. I sent a sample off to quite a few different um, publishers so I was getting in touch with them um, commissioning editors via sure. um, LinkedIn and just networking a lot of conferences so I went to every IATEPO and was constantly yep. uh, talking to people increasing my network trying to support myself yeah I fantastic um, do you because have you spoke about the uh, the dearth of ESOL materials, which is a, a pet peeve of mine too, because uh, we do spend a lot of time adapting it into an ESOL class, don't we? Yeah. Would you like to see like big ESOL projects, like you know course books, textbooks, or uh, resource books, activity books in the ESOL sector? 
Yeah, I would love that. Be amazing. The, pro- the problem is that it would need to be by, I think, to make it, well, would it? I don't know. Yeah, would it work internationally? I think, it, yeah, it can work internationally. Like my book, I tried to make it so it would work in other English language speaking contexts. But you do end up limiting yourself in some ways. Some of the materials that I love making are like, I don't know, a walking tour around Glasgow or yeah. things to do on a rainy day in Glasgow or that kind of thing, which are really, really specific to yeah. the area that I live in. Community centres where you can go and volunteer, that kind of thing. It's a valid so, point. Yeah, the ESOL becomes very um, connected to the community that your students live in and so we contextualise our materials for them. It doesn't yeah. mean to say there isn't a worth in it though. Does there? No. Maybe what we'll, maybe what we need to do then is create a, a database. You know, like one stop you know, something yeah, like that. And it's yeah, I've thought about that often actually. Yeah. Well, maybe we can do a project maybe together, Emma. Whoa, we can have a chat mm-hmm. about that. Um now there's something I know that you've gotten into recently that I want to ask you about, which is graphic facilitation. Mm-hmm. First of all, tell me what it is, tell me why you love it, and tell me how we can use it in the English language classroom. Okay, so graphic facilitation. So for years, I didn't draw. Well, I, I kind of stopped drawing in class when Google Images came around. And then instead of drawing a quick little sketch on the whiteboard, which was what I did way back when, 2006, probably before Google Images were a big thing, um, I yeah I would draw a picture on the whiteboard, but then obviously Google Images came along and ruined all that. All that just so absolutely. <laughs> but <clears throat> I always loved drawing in the classroom and always thought it was quite important mm-hmm. to do. And then uh, a girl came, uh, Emma O'Leary, who was a graphic facilitator, came to my college and gave us a quick one-hour session on how to use drawings in the classroom and there were really basic things like one step up from a stick man yeah but just uh, they look very smart like and very very quick things that you can do to illustrate a point and to just engage learners Mm -hmm. so like you could draw a light bulb for example and then that'll and then that'll instead of writing ideas on the whiteboard you draw a light bulb Mm -hmm. and it just engages learners so much more um and things like when I'm teaching my literacy class, some of them don't know how to read and write in their first language, so they can't take notes. But if they can draw a very simple picture, and yeah. it doesn't need to be a, a, a work of art. I think there's this belief that um, drawings need to be a work of art. And actually, that's quite, it just puts a lot of people off. That's not yeah. what it's about. Um, to me and to graphic facilitators in general, drawing is a language. It's a visual language and it's a means of communication. So it's... Um, about using your visual vocabulary to draw, uh, to draw and to communicate. So, uh, yeah, so at the moment I've got this big, I've got, a, I have my visual dictionary. I don't know if you'll be able to see oh, this. Brilliant. So this is my uh, visual dictionary that I'm working on at the moment. And I just add my Thanks pictures. To, yeah. Oh God, there's loads. Yeah, loads of them. Oh, that's so, amazing. Just as you would learning an alphabet and yeah, learning yeah. an alphabet, for example, you just learn different icons and then mm-hmm. add them to your vocabulary and then they're there to be used on the whiteboard. And you f- do you find that the students can engage better yeah. with that? Do you get the point across faster because it's an image rather than Yeah. Text? And I can still do it on you can still do it on online. So face to face, yes, it's much easier because you've got your whiteboard, but you can use a visualizer. Or sometimes I'll like take a picture, like what I'm going to do just after is use this. So ah, on diary. Yeah, God, that's so simple, but it looks brilliant. Day, I'll take a picture of it, and I'll or I'll display it with my visualizer, and then the students will fill it in and talk about what they're planning to do for present continuous in the future. It's just a, I don't know. Smart. I think in today's world, everything's nice and polished, isn't it? And digital. And yeah, you could use Canva and yeah, you could use Google Images, but kind of takes the fun out of it and the creativity out of it. 
I wonder if if because it's something you've drawn, you know, their their teacher has drawn, it feels more approachable. Oh, well, I can add to this or I can yeah. replicate that rather than, as you say, a nice clip art from Google or a, a, or a yeah. photograph, which might feel more imposing. I love the idea. And you and to me, it sort of marries really well in an ESOL classroom. I use I'm use a lot of visual prompts rather than always. Um just text I think text can be quite dry so this appeals and you say that um even if you're not a great drawer it's it's easy to do yeah like it doesn't need to be actually if you look very closely at this you'll notice that <laughs> squint oh it looks it's good not though. a bit of squint it's the point the point the important the important thing is that it gets the point across that's very true oh so, yeah very I think if I was to go into a classroom and draw perfect drawings, they'd be quite intimidating. Mm -hmm. And actually yeah. it's more important to be less intimidating and quite imperfect. Yeah. Okay. And it's all about, yeah, it's all about getting the point across and building a visual vocabulary. And I love those words that you're using, the visual vocabulary. You know, yeah. you know, drawing is a communi a communicative tool. I think that's brilliant. Um now I've heard on a sneaky on the grapevine that uh, you might be developing something more to do with your simple graphics. Yes, I am hoping at some point to set up an online course. I mm. uh, don't know when because I'm still playing about with all the tools and tech and learning how to use different websites and things like that. So, but watch this space. I will uh -huh. be updating people on my blog and LinkedIn and Twitter. Brilliant. So, yeah. And, and is it, it's, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's simple graphics in an ESOL classroom? Yeah, so it's basically graphic facilitation techniques for English language teachers. And I'll start with the basics, obviously. So oh, I'll look forward that. to that. Yeah, I, you yeah. can count me in. I'll be one of your first customers because it's oh, great. Excellent. Yeah. So cool. just, just to finish off today, Emily, you're obviously very passionate about ESOL and what you do. And you have such a wide variety of skills in a field that, I think the enthusiasm comes off you in waves. Tell me, why do you love working in English language teaching? Uh, I think it has to be the students. I have the best students ever. They come from all around the world. They have taught me so much about the world. Um, yeah, they're, yeah, they're just amazing. And the, the stories that they've told me and the things that they've been through just are so jaw dropping and they, they've just overcome so much and we, yeah when you bump into them in the street five years later and they've 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 now got a supervisor post in some I don't know in a care home or whatever and you just think oh wow you've come so far from your beginner literacy your literacy class from yeah but it shows I think it's about possibility mm -hmm. about you know it I mean it's you can pluck any cliche out of the air that you want it's life affirming but the possibility of education and where that can lead somebody as you say a lot of ESOL students tend to have overcome something before they've arrived with us so the ability to transform their futures yeah. I think is amazing oh it's all very uh, life mm -hmm. yes it's all very good so Emily I'm going to finish there for today. It's always great to chat to you and thank you so much for your time. And I'm sure we'll see you in a Techless Scotland event soon. Thanks oh, a lot. Thank you very much. You're welcome.